Again, it's a great privilege to be here, and uh, I'm going to try to condense a lot into this uh, next hour, and uh, I just want to go ahead and get started. The first thing that I want you to know is that my country and your country, we must understand the times, we are under the judgment of God. The judgment of God has already been decreed. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm a prophet or the son of a prophet. I'm drawing my conclusions from Scripture primarily, but also from history. We are under the judgment of God. The first reason I give for that is the rampant immorality in the West. Now, you may say to me, but Brother Paul, the rampant immorality in the West is a sign that we will be judged. No, you have it backwards. The rampant immorality is the sign that we have already been judged. Now, I want you to go for just a moment. This is important with regard to the family. Go to the book of Romans. And again, we could stay in this one place for an hour, but we're going to hurry through it. Go to Romans chapter 1. And I want you to see something. He says in verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Go down to verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. Verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. You see, what you must understand is this. God has made Himself known in a special way in the West through the preaching of the Gospel and the long history of the preaching of the Gospel in the West. But the West, by and large, has rejected the person of God. Although they knew God, They did not honor Him as God or give thanks. That is the central focus of the judgment of God. Because we have had an understanding of the Gospel, because we have had a clear vision of who God is, and we have rejected that, we have moved away from God, God has turned us over to our own hearts, which has created the rampant, immorality that we see all around us. So do not think that the judgment of God is coming. It has come. Now, something very important that I want to explain to you. It was said of Benjamin Franklin's grandparents that they were Puritan in both their theology and their ethic or their morality. But that Benjamin Franklin's parents wanted the Puritan ethic without the Puritan God. And that Benjamin Franklin wanted neither of them, the God or the ethic. You see, you cannot save this country from the judgment of God by returning this country to some traditional morality. It will do no good at all. This country and my country must be returned to God. And the only way to do that is through the preaching of the gospel. So this country and my country, other countries in the West, are under the judgment of God. Now I want to give you one more evidence with regard to this. When God judges a country, He takes away or removes their legitimate forms of authority and replaces them with others. Go with me for just a moment to Isaiah. Chapter 3. Verse 1. Behold, the Lord, God of hosts, is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. The West should know this. It sees itself so strong as its walls 
impenetrable. But that is not true. Do you realize that in less than a day, God can remove supply from England, from Ireland, from Wales, from the United States of America, from every other country, and bring that country to its knees in less than 24 hours? We ought to fear God much more than we do. But then he goes on. And this is what he's going to remove. The captain of 50 and the honorable man, the counselor and the expert artisan and the skillful enchanter. Now look what he's doing. He's removing both legitimate and illegitimate forms of authority from a society and replacing that society with an authority, replacing those authorities that are legitimate with an authority that has no strength to it, has no wisdom to it. He goes on and he says this, and I will make mere lads their princes and capricious children will rule over them. It's literally speaking about an arbitrary, mutable rule that people will rule over them that have no foundation whatsoever for the decisions they make. And we all know this, when a society moves away from the rock-solid foundation of the Word of God, it becomes arbitrary. They are no longer directed by the Spirit of God, no longer founded upon the Word of God, but they are directed by the Spirit of the age and their own depraved heart. Now, when we talk about authority, this is a thing that scares people, but God has set up lines of authority. There are lines of authority in the government. Government is an institution. There is also the church herself is an authority and has a structure of authority. There is the institution of the family. And the family has a structure of authority that is ordained by God. But if you look in our society, all that has been turned on its head. Let me ask you a question. Is it not true today that the old and the wise in our culture are made to bow down to the ideas and the whims of youth that have no basis whatsoever for their own opinions, except that they are birthed from their own heart and motivated by the wicked culture that surrounds them. Now let me ask another question. In the family, where are the husbands? Where are they? Where are the fathers? In the church, where are the men of God? In the government, where are the noble men? The governments. Nothing more than capricious little boys who have set themselves against the will of God. And they ought to know this, that all their railings against God and His Christ amount to nothing. They are nothing more than tiny little gnats beating their heads against a world of granite. For God has His rule. He has His King. He set up His kingdom long ago. That nations will come and nations will fall, but the reign of Christ will continue on until the end. Now, I want us to look at some things. Our great need of the day. Men. Men of God. Manhood has been all but lost in our post-Christian culture. Men have either become feminized or emasculated, or they have become selfish, pleasure-loving, lustful Neanderthals. It is time for the men of God to rise up and take their place in the prayer closet, in the pew, in the pulpit, in the family, and in the world. It is time for us to leave aside all the whims of our culture, 
all the lies of social sciences, to set ourselves free from all these things that have so destroyed us and return to Scripture. Scripture defines biblical manhood for us. And Scripture illustrates biblical manhood in the life of Jesus Christ. And we must once again come under His Lordship and determine what it means to be a man and what it means to live out in this wicked world as men. I'm amazed at our discipleship nowadays. A young boy has presented the Gospel at college. He becomes a a Christian. He's truly converted. He's given a few books on discipleship and then he's told to go out and multiply that in the lives of other young men. Yet he doesn't even understand what it means to be a human being before God. He doesn't even understand what it means to be a biblical man or even how or where he should take his place among other men to serve his generation. We talk about so many things in Christianity, but the very things that are most important, we don't even begin to deal with. How many of you, by your fathers, were taught to be men? Using the Scriptures, trained many years of your life in the Scriptures with regard to what it means to be a man, to be masculine, to be married, to be a father, to work, My people perish for a lack of knowledge. How many of you men, those of you who even work so hard in the ministry, how many hours do you log in each week discipling your wife? Discipling your children? Raising up a godly heritage to the Lord. And what does it matter if you evangelize the whole world, but you lose your family? Or you are so responsible in secondary things, but in primary things, you've totally and completely been disobedient. God has always saved societies through raising up men of God. Is it not true that much of the progress of England even in these years, is still based upon the great Puritans that God raised up, their theology and their ethic. Is it not true that England was saved from decline by the preaching of Whitfield and Wesley and many of those who joined with them? Is it not true that in a great way England was sustained in its morality through the preaching of men like Spurgeon? And is it not true that Martin Lloyd-Jones did more for his generation through his preaching than all the politicians put together? It is the raising up of men of God to serve, to love, and even to die if necessary. Now, I want to talk about something just really quickly. It comes out of Ezekiel 22.30 and it says this, God speaking, I searched for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land so that I would not destroy it. But I found no one standing in the gap Building up the wall and standing in the gap. We hear so many people. There are prayer organizations and prayer rallies based upon standing in the gap. What does it mean? Building up the wall is something very important in ancient society. The wall was the only thing that protected the city from the enemy that was attacking. And so a city was always working to build up its wall, to shore up its foundations. And how do we do that? We do that by laying a foundation of the gospel and a foundation of the word of God. But in preaching the gospel, we have to realize this, men. It is not enough, in a sense, just to preach the gospel, just to evangelize, just to make a church that seems to be pleasant and biblical. But we have to do, as the fathers before us did, seek to submit every aspect of our life to the Word of God. That's how you build up the wall. You ask God, not some psychologist, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a father? What does it mean to be a husband? How shall I relate to my family? What is my task? How many have gone through Scripture after Scripture after Scripture simply to determine what it means to be 
a man. To build up the wall is to, is to submit absolutely everything in our life to the Word of God. But what does it mean to stand in the gap? Well, if an enemy is surrounding a city, where are they going to attack? They're going to attack where the wall is broken down. And so what are you going to do? If around your city there is a gap, then you send your finest men. Since there is no wall, they block the enemy with their own bodies. But here's the question that I have yet in all these prayer meetings have had anyone to explain. If we're standing in the gap, against whom are we standing in the gap? Well, according to Ezekiel, it's God. It's God that's coming for the city. It's God that's coming after England. It's God that's coming after the United States in judgment. And to stand in the gap is to throw yourself in front of God. Now you say, Paul, now hold on. No, you hold on. Listen. He goes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, this is what I'm going to do to Sodom. And Abraham stands in the gap. You see, God's mercy is so great that He will raise up men to stand in the gap and intercede on behalf of the very place He has determined to destroy. He said, Moses, stand back. I'm going to kill them all and I'll make a people out of you. Moses stands in the gap. So as men of God, we are to build up the wall to submit everything in our own lives, in the lives of our families, in the lives of our churches to the Word of God. But also know, judgment is coming. It may be delayed, but it will come. And it is to stand in the gap, to cry out for mercy, that God would halt His hand to give us more time to preach, more time to pray, more time to minister, to take the Gospel to the nations. Now, what is a true biblical man? I just want to read this to you. Having been regenerated by the Holy Spirit and brought to repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the true man is marked by death to self. The very opposite of what we saw here this morning and this afternoon. The death to self. True men do not count their lives dear to them. Death to self. All for His glory. All for the ones that I love. Death to self. Love for God and His fellow man. A fear of God alone. Among ministers, fear is one of the greatest sources of bondage. The fear of man is a snare. It will keep you from being used of God. Fear of God. And I might add with Wesley, a fear of sin. A fear of God alone. A passion for the honor of God, the advancement of the kingdom of God, and the doing of the will of God. That's man. Now, I want us to look just quickly. Go with me to the very first chapter of our Bible. Go to Genesis. one twenty-eight. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God made man in His own image. And as our brother pointed out earlier, not some God with a little g. Not a deity with a little d. But made in His image in this sense that we can know Him. We can respond to Him. And as His servants and stewards of creation, we can represent Him. 
We are made in the image of God for the glory of God. That's what is so wrong, even in Christian circles. It's all about man, all about man, all about man. But in the Bible, it's all about God. And that's a good thing. You see, we were made for that purpose. And if we live according to our purpose, there will be meaning in our lives, personal, real, vital, biblical meaning. When we discover that we were made for His glory, for His honor, His worship, every breath that comes into us is to go out and praise. Every beating of our heart is for Him. Every, every muscle, every fiber in our body is to be given to Him. Only then do we truly live and only then do we become men. We were made for His glory and we were made to advance His purposes upon the earth. From the very beginning, that is what we were supposed to do as men. Now I want you to look in chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for Him, corresponding to Him. God made man that man might give himself to God for the glory of God and the extension of His kingdom. God gave man a woman, a wife, that she might be a helper corresponding to Him, suitable to Him, to help Him carry out this great task. He taking the lead, He being the head, she being the wife and the helper, both of them together united for one common cause, the glory of God and the extension of His kingdom throughout all of creation. You say, but Brother Paul, there was the fall. Yes, of course, there was. But we see this very purpose regained once again and exemplified perfectly in whom? In the person of Jesus Christ. Do you want to know what a man is? You look to Him. Do you want to know what ought to be the very thing that drives the heart of a man? Well, go with me. Let's look into the heart of Christ. Go with me for a moment to the book of Matthew. Chapter 6. Verse 9. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, the perfect psychology psyche that we should have in approaching God. The perfect mindset and attitude of how the Christian is to approach God. Our Father, He is your Father indeed. And you can walk in where angels fear to tread because of the work of Christ on your behalf. He is your Father, but your Father happens to be the God of glory who reigns in heaven. And therefore also, you march into that throne room with the greatest reverence and respect. Then he points out something. And here in this prayer, we see the very heart of Jesus Christ. And I pray that some of this would be found in our own hearts. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Now, I want us to think about this. This is extremely Extremely important. When anyone looks at me, especially when my wife looks at me, this is what she should see. In my, through my eyes, in my words, and in my actions, she should see a man given to these things who gives no thought to his own welfare, no thought to his own comfort, no thought to his own plans or his own goal, but his heart beats and his mind burns and his body strains with this. God, my greatest desire is that Your name be hallowed among the nations. 
that everyone everywhere esteem your name as above all other names and give it the glory that is due it. My greatest passion is to see your kingdom expanded, your salvation reaching to the ends of the earth so that every tribe, every nation might know you. My great goal is to see your will be done in my own life, in the life of my family, that the will of God become the delight of the nations, the food of the peoples, and that they would be transformed by it. This is going to be very, very important when we talk about a headship in a few moments. Extremely, extremely important. Now, whenever you hear, especially an American, talk like that, obviously it must mean now that we need to get busy. We need to do something. We need to form an organization. We need to have a crusade. We need to go out and change the world. We need to get out of the salt shaker and get on to the earth. We need to do something. We need to plan a church. We need to go out and do missions. No, we don't. We need to be obedient. True zeal and true passion for God manifests itself in the most simple and most quiet obedience to the things that God has given us to do in His providence. And so when I talk about all these things, how should they be worked out? They should be worked out in concentric circles. What do I mean? How can I cry out, Hallowed be Thy name, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, if that very thing is not happening in me? How can I desire that for my wife, for my children, for the nations, for my church, unless it is happening in me. So first of all, the first circle in my life is that I might grow in godliness. Now I want us to look at that for just a moment. Again, we don't have much time, but I want you again, just for a moment, to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In our last lesson, we spoke about how we should discipline ourselves to godliness, that we should give ourselves to training. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, listen to what it says. Do you not know that those who run in the race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. First of all, men, we cannot be used to raise others to a caliber that we ourselves have not attained. The greatest need of my wife is that I be more godly. The greatest need of my children that I have a more Christ-like character. The greatest need of the nations is that I learn to walk at least in part in the righteousness of the Messiah, of the Christ. You say your family, your children, your wife, all around you, everyone has such great needs. We need a godly man. We need men who set themselves, who study the Scriptures, not just to know, not just to argue, but to be transformed. Again, after 16 years of marriage, I can tell you, the greatest need my wife has is a godlier husband. I would suppose the same would be true for your own wife. And a man driven by the things of God. Now again, this is something that I would love to speak about to a great length. But we must go on. First circle, the man. Rather than run out, and young men listen to me, your street preaching and all that, I applaud it. I want you to continue doing it. Do it more. But a superficial man does superficial preaching. 
an ungodly man eventually will not stand. Your greatest need is conformity to Jesus Christ. Now the second circle. If I am to be used so that throughout the world God's name be hallowed and His kingdom come and His will be done, what is the next thing I should take upon myself? The next ministry. In the providence of God for me, the next ministry is my wife. If I'm sitting on an airplane and someone asks me, and they always do, what do you do? I go, oh, uh, I'm a husband. And they go, well, yeah, okay. What else do you do? Well, I'm a father. What else do you do? Well, I also, I, I preach a little bit and I work with a missionary organization. I'm not just trying to find a way to witness to people and I'm not just trying to be cute. I have found that that must be the rule in my life. The most important ministry I have on the face of this earth is to my wife. If you disagree with me, all of you, then show me your families. Show me your marriages. Prove to me with your marriages that I'm wrong. The most important ministry is my wife. Now, many of you would probably think that I would say my family or my children. After all, our children are so important. I want you to know I love my children and the closest I probably come to idolatry is with my children. I love them so much. But they are not first place in my life. They do not come before my wife. Let me give you a very crude but effective illustration. If I'm in a boat with my wife and my three children and I'm the only one who can swim and the boat goes down and I can only save one, I'm saving my wife. You say, I never heard of such a thing. Yes, probably not. And that's what's wrong with our society. You see, if I love that woman, more than any other person on the face of this earth, my children are going to be the happiest children on the face of the earth. They are going to know that their home in this turbulent, upside-down world, that this home that they're in is rock solid. Dad's not going anywhere. Also, if I love that woman passionately, my boys are going to watch me and they're going to learn how to love a woman. And even more importantly, my little girl is going to watch me and that's going to set the standard so that when some incompetent, stupid young man <laughs> makes all sorts of pledges toward her, she is going to send him on his way. She'll say, you know nothing about love. I have watched a man love one woman deeply. Grow up, read your Bible, then don't come back to me. Go talk to my father. Now, headship. I want you to look at something in Ephesians that's very, very important. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Because of this, the idea of a wife submitting to a husband has been twisted all around so that we take, yes, wives must submit to husbands, but husbands must submit to wives and therefore there's a mutual submission. That's not what this is teaching. Paul is going through different areas of society and teaching us how to function. In the body of Christ, verse 21, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Within the marriage, verse 22, fear, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. With regard to the family, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then with regard to what we would now call employers and employees, verse 5, 
of chapter 6, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. Paul is telling us how we function in society. That although in Christ I am my wife's brother and she is my sister, and as brother and sister in Christ, I must love her and sacrifice for her. She must love me and sacrifice for me. She needs to be open to my rebuke and I need to be open to hers. Her correction ought to be an invi invited into my life and my correction ought to be invited into hers. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. But in the context of the family, the Scriptures clearly teach that I am the head. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that I make all the decisions? No. Does that mean that all kinds of things are going on she doesn't even know about? No. What does it mean? Well, the best way to show you is through an example. Let's say that we have to make a decision to move somewhere. We have to make the decision by December 15th. Well, I come up with an idea of where we ought to go and I share it with my wife. After some prayer, she comes back to me and says, I simply don't agree. Now, I'm not just going to follow what she says, but neither am I going to do what I think. Why? I have a great deal of respect for her. And we are one. And we are brothers and sisters in Christ. So if she doesn't agree for me, that's a red flag. A red flag to do what? To wait? To pray more? To study about the situation more? To work at it together? Until we can come to a common consensus with regard to what we ought to do. But let's say that it's December 14th and a decision has to be made. It's my obligation to make the decision. And if I am right, I do not gloat over her. And if I am wrong, she does not hold it over my head. Someone has to make the decision. And that is my call. It is my call to lead my family. And yes, it is a terrifying responsibility. Gentlemen, I have been punched. I have been kicked. I have been prodded. There is very few things that have not been done to me. Grab me, throw me off a bus, do whatever you want to do, and I'm really resilient. I'm just going to bounce right back. I'm not even probably going to get angry. You lay your hand on my wife, and you better pray that Jesus comes back before I get to you. Now, why do I say that? You lay your hand on my daughter. These Americans, they're horrible, aren't they? But I want to tell you something. The point I'm trying to make is this. The most precious thing I'll ever give another man is my daughter. Yes, I'm going to lead this woman. Her father is God. And He loves her more than I love my own daughter. Yes, I should do it with fear and trembling. And for the glory of God and for her sake, not my own. Do you see that? Now, the point that I really want to get to at this moment that is so very important. A woman reads this Scripture. And let's say that she wants to be a biblical woman. She wants to be godly. So she reads this Scripture and she knows that the Lord is commanding her to submit to her husband and also to be His helpmate in accomplishing certain purposes. But she looks over at the typical contemporary Western Christian man and he is all about himself. And everybody else is an extension of him. He lives for his own work, his own profession, his own promotion. In the United States, he lives for his hobbies, his weekends, his hanging out with the guys. It's all about him, all about him. And she says to herself, I'm to submit to that. Live my life and help a man meet all his self-centered, selfish desires and plans. You can see where bitterness would enter in, can't you? But now look at it this way. What if she looks over there at her husband 
And she sees self-sacrifice exemplified. And he, she can see in his eyes and in his actions, hallowed be thy name, Lord. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. She looks at a man who has given himself over to the will of God and seen that will of God first and foremost in his care for his wife and his care for his children and then his care for the church and then his care for the rest of the world. She's going to look at a man like that and say, yeah, okay. I can be submissive to a man like that who is all about the kingdom. She says, yes, I can help him. Because I'm not helping him help himself. I am helping him carry out the will of God. You see how different it is? Men, you see, you can learn all the things about marriage, but if you don't have Christ-like integrity and character, it won't work. We're demanding that our wives listen to us, that they respect us, that they submit to us, but we must be men of total self-sacrifice who exist to glorify God through serving the people who are closest to us. And that begins with our wife and then our children and then our church. Now, I want to talk just a moment about the rule of Caesar. It was self-serving, self-promoting, demanding, merciless and destructive. It was a godlike rule in which everything was centered on Caesar and was an extension of Caesar. It was all about Caesar's person, position, place in history, and vision. Daniel 7, 7, After this I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down. Some men who are always demanding that they be respected and that their wives submit to them, this is the type of rule they have in their home. Jesus said in Matthew 20, 25, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. What is He saying? We use our authority in the family to serve our families, to bless our families, to strengthen our families for the glory of God. Jesus Christ in the book of John, knowing where He had come from, knowing where He was going, knowing that all authority had been given unto Him, what does He do? He binds Himself with a towel and He takes the lowest place among His men. Do you want to be head of your household? Then that automatically makes you the servant of your household. You're not the king who after work sits down on his mighty throne in front of his television set. You get off work, your work has just begun. Now, I want us to look again at Ephesians chapter 5. Oh, we're running out of time. Ephesians chapter 5. And I want us just to look at this. Look at verse 23. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Christ is the Savior of his bride. Now, we are not Christ. And the church is in no way redeemed, nor is any individual redeemed through our activity. But there is a principle to be learned here. That God uses the husband in the life of his wife to be a saving influence, a sanctifying influence, to promote her spiritual health, to help her on her way to being more and more Christ-like. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her, dying to ourselves for the sake of our wives. More than any other place, this is where death to self really becomes real. Laying down our lives 
for the benefit of our wives. Now, what is that benefit? That benefit is the same benefit in all of Christianity. We lay down our lives for our wives not to meet every one of her desires, because like us, she is not fully sanctified and some of her desires are bad. We lay down our lives and we do everything we do for our wives that they might grow in sanctification and conformity to Christ. He laid down His life, verse 26, so that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word. The ministry of the Word with your wife. What is it? Does she know that you're the most important? That she's the most important person in your life? Does she know that she's the focal point of your ministry? And that in fact, you've come to the realization that if you don't minister well to her, you can't even, you can't be an elder. It's not the responsibility of the church or some Sunday school class, and most certainly it's not the responsibility of some woman's group to disciple your wife. Sir, it is your responsibility. And something that we have forgotten, just very, very important here in verse 29, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Are these words descriptive of your relationship with your wife? Of all the things that convict me, possibly these two words are the most convicting. Is she nourished by you? Growing because of her relationship, her unity with you. Is she growing? Is she cherished? Gentlemen, let me say something. It may be kind of offensive. But just give you, shock you out of your slumber. If the only time you hold your wife, embrace your wife, kiss your wife, is prior to sex, you make her feel cheap. Do you sit with her just to sit with her? Do you hold her just to hold her? Do you take her by the hand just to take her by the hand? You see, she needs to know she's loved. She needs to hear she's loved. That's why it says, love your wife. Isn't it interesting that here at least, Paul does not tell the women to love their husbands. I don't need my wife to call me three times a day at the office. I don't need her to send me flowers. I don't need her to say, I love you, I love you, I love you. But isn't it interesting, Paul tells the wife, respect your husband. She must respect me or I'll die. She needs my love. And it needs to be affirmed. I need her respect. And if I have it, I can wake up one morning and everybody on the planet can be outside my door with signs saying, down with Paul, we hate Paul. And it's not going to bother me. <laughs> as long as I know that woman in my house respects me. You see that? Now, just quickly, oh, just look in Philippians chapter 6. Philippians, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now listen to me. How many millions, if not billions of dollars are spent every year on Sunday school material for children, Sunday school conferences for children, and the training of Sunday school teachers? How many man hours, millions of man hours spent in the church organizing Sunday schools and everything else, and yet there's not one place in the Scriptures where it says the church is supposed to train our children or that we're supposed to have a Sunday school. But let me ask you this. How many, how many millions of dollars are spent? How many hours in conferences are spent training fathers to do what the Scriptures command? Nothing. Zero. Do you know the early Baptists I hear in England fought hard against Sunday school? 
And this was their prophecy. If the church takes over the training of the Christian's children, then family devotion and personal discipleship in the home will be destroyed. It is not the responsibility of some Sunday school teacher to teach my sons and my daughters. It is mine and not haphazardly. Their entire eternal destiny depends on what they get from their father. So it must be marked out. It must be prayed over day after day. You want to count the cost for serving Jesus? Then before you go out and do something big in His name out there in the public, do what you're supposed to do with your wife and your children. Discipleship every day. Thinking up new ways to communicate Christ, to teach the Scriptures, to go through the catechisms. All these things. Let's just look at something for a moment. A child is born, almost immediately goes to a secular nursery because the mother goes back to work. Sometimes it's necessary, but for the most, it's because they want finer things and they're selling their children for a bowl of wine. Why do most people have children? Other people raise them. So they put their child in the nursery. And then when the child's old enough, it goes into a secular, maybe a kindergarten or primary. And then after that to secondary. And then after that, the university. Listen to me, 18 years, eight hours a day, five days a week, Caesar has trained your children. So don't be complaining when your children our sons of Caesar. And what do we do to counter that? We take them to Sunday school where they paint pictures of Noah's Ark. But we do! Do you see that? Fathers, look at what we're doing. Then look at the media. Just just think about it. Most children in the West spend at least three hours in front of an ungodly television set or playing video games or something. Think about that. Then think about their peers, the other children around them. I want you to think about the three greatest lies of the devil with regard to children. One is the generation gap. Young people need to be with young people. Do you know that directly contradicts Scripture? Do you know that most youth groups are direct contradictions of Scripture? They are. If you're mad about it, come see me afterwards. I'm ready. (laughs) They're direct contradictions. Look, the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 20, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Another lie, socialization. If your children aren't with other children, they won't learn social skills. Let me, let me just ask you a question. What kind of social skills are the children of England learning from other children of England? Oh, they're sitting around, aren't they? And they're studying about Christ. And they're studying about noble character and virtue. And they're reading positive works of literature. And they're discussing art, science, music, and beauty. All the things that separate us from the brute beast. No, they're not. They're doing the same thing the young people are doing in our country. My own country. I've walked around the streets of England and Ireland and Wales. There were things I've seen with my own eyes among young people here in the last two weeks that are exactly like what's among the young people in my own country. Things I have seen that I feel like I've almost been baptized in filth. So our children need to be socialized in a culture that hates God? And then another one. Well, I send my child to school so that my child can be a witness. Your your child's maybe not even converted. And if they are converted, are they ready to go to war? Send them to Iraq then at 11 years old. Because I can assure you this, what's in our schools is far more dangerous than what's in Iraq. I know I'm shaking some of you up, but you didn't ask me to come here to just make you feel happy, did you? Look at what we're doing. We're losing everything because we've bought into the lies of this world. I encourage you, go home. 
Read Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. That the primary purpose for God giving you children and the primary purpose of you tutoring them is that they will love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And listen to me, gentlemen. To do even a tenth part of the things we've learned in Scripture today, it will cost you dearly. Let's pray. Father, I pray that You would use this quick and Lord, maybe too abrupt word to move Your people to search the Scriptures, to be obedient. In Jesus' name, Amen.